It was December 5th, 1996. I was 27 years old. Please don't do the math, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and I had never been outside of the United States before. I was being sent by my graduate school to work with the non-governmental organization CARE in Kenya. I would be working to implement a medical record system in a local district hospital while also teaching local women to diagnose and treat common childhood illnesses in their respective villages. ATM machines were just becoming popular on the global scale, and I, a very naive traveler, as such, on my one layover from Atlanta, Georgia to Nairobi, I enjoyed walking around the streets of London and withdrew $200 at the time that seemed like an immense amount of money that I was sure would last me in my new African home for the next three to four months. <laughs> Y'all, I was very wrong. <laughs> the lies whiteness tell us. Each week, my rent was due at the modest hostel in the small village of Siaya, Kenya. Every morning, I would enjoy a breakfast tea and a fried flatbread called chapati before beginning my work for the day. Siaya was about seven hours from Nairobi and two hours from the next largest city called Kisumu. My intention was not to carry a lot of cash around and to rely on ATMs to replenish my lost funds. Unfortunately, Siaya was a rural village with brownouts and little modernization, and Kisumu, the second largest city, had no ATMs at all, leaving only Nairobi, seven hours away, my out for money. By my second week, I had almost ran out of all of the funds that I brought and became rather desperate. And I have my grandmother's sewing machine table in my house. And unbeknownst to me, I had forgotten that I put my letters to my family from Kenya in that sewing machine. And I found them last week. And I opened up one of those letters that had a cryptic message in it. And then I remembered, oh yes, I sent my ATM card through the mail from Siaya, Kenya to Borger, Texas with a very cryptic message that only my parents would be able to decode, which was in fact my PIN number for my ATM card that was also present in the letter. I really had hoped that it would make it there and that my family could wire me funds via Western Union, which was very much accessible in Kisumu. Um, though I did have to ride, uh, again, two hours in public transportation to get there. But over the first two weeks, I had befriended a local young man around my age, Peter. His family ran a small grocery store in the village and had a side room with an opened kind of bench area where they served french fries or chips, as they referred to them, and ice-cold sodas. It was a really popular local hangout, and I found myself there often. Peter's family were wonderfully welcoming, and the interactions with the local people aided in my learning the regional language, the Lul, because my graduate school had forced me to learn Swahili, and no one spoke Swahili in the village that I was living. <laughs> I remember that on my last night in that village hostel where my money had ran out, I was really upset. I didn't know what to do. Again, not a traveler. I really was down to one bottle of iodinized water left and four oranges that I was hoping would last me for the next week's meal <laughs> while I waited for my parents to hopefully respond to my letter. <laughs> And that night, I knew that I was not going to be able to pay my hostel bill for the next month. And I was desperately trying to figure out what to do. I felt so alone, so isolated, and so very sad. And then I remember a knock on my door. And when I went to answer, there stood Peter and one of his younger brothers. They had a soda in one hand and a bag of french fries in another. 
and I was starving. <laughs> I think I ate those french fries faster than anything else in my whole life. It was very obvious to them that I had been crying, and Peter asked what was wrong, and I explained my situation. He completely understood, to my shock, and explained that they had actually come over that night to invite me to move into the family storage room behind the grocery store, where he and his five brothers stayed during the week while they tended to the store and the french fry shop and went to school. In turn, they would allow me a place to sleep and shower if I agreed to cover the staffing at the french fry shop. <laughs> I had become really good at frying french fries. <laughs> Simply put, Peter and his family embodied a love for a relative stranger that raged against my American-born and Texas-raised individualism and understanding. It turns out that night, I experienced firsthand an example of something that the Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis describes in her book, Fierce Love, as the African philosophy of Ubuntu. She explains that the concept of Ubuntu is taken from a specific phrase in the Zulu language, Umuntu gumuntu gabantu. The online Zulu teacher and linguist Thando has a language session on her video uh, class explaining that the phrase is actually a single word used three times to produce a profound philosophy. Umuntu, she explains, means person. Ungumuntu means a person is a person, and gabantu means because of other people. So together, the phrase means, I am a person because of others. According to a recent article from the African Journal of Social Work, Ubuntu can be thought of as humanism from an African perspective. Though the phrase is Zulu in origin, these authors make the argument that the humanist perspective of moving through the world as a people rather than as an individual is actually a pan-African philosophy. For the remainder of my time in Africa, I would experience profound Ubuntu in so many other ways. Today, we are commemorating all of those individuals who served in various wars defending these lands and whom's li whom lives were lost. I think this is a wonderful exercise in Ubuntu. You, like me, may be more of a pacifist, and thus this holiday is complex in its purpose, seemingly uplifting acts of war. However, this African philosophy may spark in us a reminder that these were in fact selfless acts born out of many simple and complex reasons for joining our armed military forces. But their, their death brought is what we are lifting up today, that sense of being more than an individual. It means that we can honor these lives and insist that we simultaneously continue working to minimize harm through continued war efforts. I really, really appreciate Reverend Dr. Lewis's book, Fierce Love. It's really poignant for me as well because as many of you know, our faith movement is currently reflecting on what we mean when we are together. How do we want to be, what holds us, what's in the center of our faith. We are currently wrestling with that as General Assembly approaches. You may have seen the invites to have lots of discussions about that at GA. If you are going and attending, I hope you do. Her book really suggests that the philosophy of Mbutu is the love that for her is centered in her Christian universalist faith. So, she is a Christian universalist, which means she's a distant relative to our universalism. Or rather, we are to hers. I wonder, though, if it is the elusive spirit of life and love that we also sing about and many of, and many of us tend to revere. 
Reverend Dr. Lewis proclaims that fierce love is an unstoppable force that encourages us to confront social and political injustice with courage and ferocity, while also recognizing and celebrating inherent worth and dignity of every person. Sound familiar? Reverend Dr. Lewis goes on to give real and practical examples from her own very complicated life and familial relationships that lift up this elusive, fierce love. She uh, witnesses that it is often more difficult to choose that path of fierce love. It sometimes comes with boundaries set and often can manifest with anger. Throughout the book, she refers to the Christian scripture where the prophet Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And after thinking about this for a moment, he answers, love God with all of your heart, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is that we are to love our neighbors as ourself. I memorized this verse as a child every day vacation Bible school, which for those of you who don't know is a lovely, I loved it, I kind of miss it, it's a Southern Baptist thing where kids spend the summer memorizing scripture verses and learning about Jesus. And I am reminded of that verse. That verse is Mark chapter 12, verse 31. And I admit that though I memorized this scripture again and again every summer, I never once reflected on its actual meaning. But Reverend Dr. Lewis does, and she makes a really interesting point. She points out that there is an assumption in that second commandment. The assumption is one that suggests that we are only capable of loving others when we have come to love ourselves. This is a foundational belief in social justice corners. We cannot do our justice work if we have not reflected on our own past and present. We must fully engage in authenticity before we try to help mend the issues of the world around us. And as I read her reflection on this scripture verse, I couldn't help but hear another powerful voice of our time in my ear. If you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you going to love somebody else? It was RuPaul, supermodel. <laughs> supermodel and drag mother to all. If RuPaul were here right now, oh God, I would love that. <laughs> but if RuPaul were here, how would you reflect on this question of loving yourself before loving others? This kind of radical self-love happens so slowly, at least from my experience, over time. Much like Laura Zucker's beautiful anthem, it is a way of throwing us back into the sea and letting all those turbulent waters tumble me, wear me down, humble me, Smooth my sharp edges and I'll be reborn. I'll be somebody's treasure after the storm. Similar to Laura Zucker, RuPaul, and Reverend Dr. Lewis. <laughs> Dr. Lewis uses her own story to underscore that very practical and important idea that self-love and radical authenticity is a way for us to prepare to embrace a fierce love that is beyond ourselves. She also says that fierce love is inherently communal. It grounds us in our belief that we are all connected and calls us to take responsibility for one another. For us as Unitarian Universalists, the act of radical authenticity and self-love, I see that represented in our responsible search for truth and meaning. And clearly, that aspect of interdependence and interconnected web of existence among all of us is in Ubuntu. I returned from my life-changing experience in Kenya in late March of 1997, and I was not the same person who left. 
I had been adopted into an amazing family that I have remained connected to for all of these years. We have witnessed together growing older, births, marriages, illnesses, and deaths. The improvements of the internet and social media have been able to keep us connected through some of the roughest times in both of our lives. Ubuntu still lives in me. It was a gift that transformed me as well before my Unitarian Universalist experience. It's my fervent hope that our faith tradition and the wider world might be able to find and embrace this radiant essence of Ubuntu at the core of our beliefs. If we were to do so, the trivialities that divide us might lose their significance. Instead, we might celebrate and honor racial differences, respect and affirm diverse expressions of sexuality and gender, and work collectively to ensure everyone's basic needs for housing, food, and economic security are met. My prayer is the light of Ubuntu permeates our hearts, guiding our actions and shaping our future where love and understanding might prevail. Together, as a people, I believe that we can manifest this transformative power of fierce love and create a, a world rooted in compassion and unity. Ubuntu, Gumuntu, Gabantu. I am a person because of others. We are a people together.